You know, there's so much to discuss here with you. I have to start this interview asking you one of the biggest questions that pretty much every American is asking, reopening and its status. Where is New Jersey in its reopening and where is your township? And with the surge of cases that we're seeing, 31 states are increasing in their COVID-19 cases, 24 states have paused their reopening. Where are we standing in New Jersey? Well, New Jersey is doing pretty well as compared to other states. We had one of the worst outbreaks early on, uh, but we responded as quickly as we could. And now the rates are relatively low, and that's why the governor has been allowing for more opening to take place. That being said, we are seeing some more increases in the cases lately, um, a slight uptick. So I know that the governor is looking at that very closely. We in the township, uh, you know, there were a few weeks in a row where we had no new cases. And now I would say over the last two weeks, we had about more than 10 cases. So, I mean, it's it's not an explosion by any means of the imagination, but it's definitely concerning. And we have to make sure that everyone is, is going by guidelines and even beyond that really thinking about how necessary it is for people trying to limit that. Yes, definitely. Let's talk about your township real quick here because I have a lot of questions on how Montgomery Township is handling the COVID-19 crisis. What have been some of the, the biggest measures you've had to take in order to combat the economic ramifications as well as the healthcare crisis that we're seeing in the entire nation? Sure. Well, uh, Governor Murphy always says that economic health has to come from public health. And I completely agree with that, that, you know, the economy can only be strong if all of us, uh, the public, are strong and healthy. So, um, you know, our initial response was all about making sure that we were cutting back on people's face-to-face -face interactions. When we closed the municipal building, the township closed its uh, public schools, um, and then the governor obviously had all of his orders to close down businesses and playgrounds and parks and things of that nature. So I think it's a cautious approach where we slowly have been opening along with the guidelines from the state, uh, emphasizing the importance of masking, working with our businesses to make sure that we help them adapt, You know, whether it is by working with them in creating outdoor dining facilities where they might not have any had any before. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting. It's given uh, our town a little bit of a European look with all these terraces and outdoor uh, booths. So there is something nice about that and seeing people, definitely you see more people walking outside, biking and things of that nature than you would have uh, before COVID. So trying to help people enjoy the outdoors and local parks and uh, places like that to entertain themselves and to find some some peace and recreation. Is there any concern that New Jersey or perhaps your township will have to roll back on its reopening as of right now, Tuesday? Well, I think that, um, you know, there was the decision that we were going to be starting op uh, indoor dining. Right. And then we saw that in other states, especially indoor dining and bars were some of the hot spots where uh, COVID was spreading. And so, you know, the governor decided not to do that. I think it's important for us to be really strong on masking um, and potentially have mandatory masking even outdoors, because right now it's highly recommended outdoors, mandatory indoors. But the research has shown that masking really does make a difference. And so we need to do everything that we can. And then now that there are outbreaks in other states, we have to follow the protocols for quarantine, self-quarantine, if you happen to travel to those states, uh, for resources for contact tracing. Yeah. Um, I don't know about whether we're going to have to backtrack. It's possible. We're always looking at it. Uh, but I think we might definitely have to slow down some of the openings that we were planning to do. And I'm assuming you agree with the governor's decision of putting a list of states uh, that are coming from these hotspot areas and to ask them to quarantine for two weeks. What has your take been on it? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the U.S. is a huge country. And so one part of the country can be on the downside, on the down curve of the outbreak, whereas another part could see it surging. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. 
Um, and I know when the outbreak first started in New Jersey, I had family and friends in other states saying, oh, you should come to our state. We don't have that problem. But seeing what was happening in the rest of the world, I knew that it was just a matter of time. It's going to get everywhere. It's just a matter of time um, and the responses. And just as we have you know, limited travel from countries that are hotspots, we have to do that geographically within the states as well, because um, otherwise you're undermining the work that's been done to isolate the outbreak. So absolutely, I think it's very important for us to have a handle on who's traveling where, to discourage travel to hotspot areas, um, and potentially even stop travel uh, from places that have uh, severe outbreaks taking place. In terms of looking at the South Asian American uh, community and just the, the immigrant diaspora in general, Mayor, what have you seen as the impact of COVID-19 on those communities, especially in your township? Definitely. I mean, we've seen research that particularly the Black community in the U.S. has been really hard hit by COVID um, and the Latinx community to some degree because of the fields of work that they're in. But something that I haven't seen talked about a lot is that the South Asian community has also been very hard hit because of the fields of work that a lot of people in our community are in, whether it is medical professional or it's a gas station and uh, small businesses that have a lot of uh, customers coming in and out. And so anecdotally, I've seen a lot of people from our community having family members or loved ones who've passed away even either in the US or in South Asia as well. So I think that our community has really been touched by this. Most people know someone who's, who's died or who's gotten ill. And so I've also seen that our community is taking this very seriously. Mm -hmm. I do think that we are following the guidelines. We know what a public health crisis can do to, to a community or to a country. Um, and some of the strongest measures that were taken in New Jersey were taken by South Asian American mayors. So, um, you know, that, that kind of shows the important perspective that our community brings, um, but also that it, the sad part is that it is touching our community and most of us do know medical professionals or others who have got disease, disease and even died. Yes, definitely. In terms of looking at then racial disparity, which communities would you see, would you say have been impacted by that the most? Well, you know, there has been a focus on the black community and the Latinx community in terms of high infection rates and then high death rates. And that has to do a lot with um, the social indicators of health and the fact that people are more in service professions where they might be interacting with people they might work in essential businesses that can't that didn't close down even at the height of the pandemic whether it's you know in medical care or um, you know grocery stores or other places that people were frequenting um, but it also just has to do with the health disparities that exist in our country where minorities, particularly black, black and Latinx communities do not have the same levels of health care, might not have a regular doctor, might not be able to afford to um, take care of their health or, or have their health looked after in the same way. So that's one certain indicator. But I think especially with our communities, with the South Asian communities, high percentage of medical professionals, yeah. it's definitely um, hit our community very hard as well. In terms of looking at your plans for the next uh, few weeks, what would you say is your focus uh, for the next couple of weeks? And, and where do you need to put the most attention in? Is it the economic uh, health of everybody or the actual healthcare industry? Well, you know, as I said, in New Jersey, we're not seeing, you know, our hospitals our surge is not there anymore. Like it's not that our hospitals are over full or that we have field hospitals as we did at the height of the pandemic. But I think it's the anticipation of looking at what is our contingency planning? You know, I'm though I'm not making the decisions for the schools, just working with the school board and the school district to understand what their plans are. I think that that's the biggest decision point that we're at in our state right now. How is how are our schools going to operate? Um, are they going to operate? And I know that the governor has laid out plans for um, allowing school districts to open for in-person instruction, right. but the logistics, the actual specific logistics of that have not been worked out yet. Um, so I think that that's an absolutely essential thing to work on. Um, and then there are all the social elements 
that were brought up on the movements for social justice that we saw, you know, all the protest marches and demands for equality. So this is a moment where I think we've all been forced to kind of reassess our country and our state and our communities and see how can we make things more fair and equal. And so I think that that's certainly something that I'm dedicating a lot of my time to working on and thinking about. Yes, let's talk about this whole concept of racial justice as well as uh, systemic racism, police brutality. You know, today is Blackout Tuesday. It's a day in which we are celebrating black-owned businesses, and it's a movement in which everyone really is pushing for black American voices. Your comments on Blackout Tuesday and how important is it for us to observe it? Well, um, I think that you know, any one particular day or any one particular uh, movement is not the, the core of it. It can't be a one day thing, um, although these are all very important for bringing attention to it. I think that what we're seeing is that uh, an acknowledgement of racial disparity and the need to work in a, in a conscious way to always center these issues. And so in Montgomery itself, we had, um, I organized a Montgomery Speaks Out Against Racism event, uh, you know, the week after the death of uh, George Floyd, and we had a resolution against racism and violence, including police violence. Um, there was a, a rally that had over six or 700 people who attended uh, in person, and then we have been doing sustained conversations between leaders in our police department and members of the black community to talk about what are the issues, what are the concerns, how can we better serve the community. Um, and then there's going to be more forums of that nature. Our school district has had events where children, former students, parents could talk about the uh, experiences of racism that they've had. Mm -hmm. And it's it's been very sad. It's very, very sad to hear about the types of things that students have been, uh, you know, had to deal with in the schools, that feeling of not being safe. Uh, so it's something it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that our communities are safe for everyone and where, you know, no one feels and no one has experienced that type of. Since, um, since the death of George Floyd, as you said, we've seen nationwide protests. I know in New Jersey, a lot of these protests and demonstrations were very peaceful and they were demanding for justice. I also know that in New Jersey there have been some legislation already approved to help uh, you know, bring forth a greater discussion and have some changes being made. But if you're looking at the South Asian community, where do you think our role and responsibility lie in this conversation? And how important then do we become as allies of the black community? Well, I mean, I think it's the moral obligation of every American to uh, affiliate themselves on the side of justice, on the side of, side of equality. Um, I do think that traditionally, probably a lot, large part of our community was not so engaged in this in these issues because perhaps we didn't really understand the history, we didn't know the history, uh, we didn't see our as a part of it. But, now I'm seeing much more uh, speech and uh, participation from South Asian organizations, uh, an organization that I'm involved with, ISA, uh, Inspiring South Asian American Women, specifically had a panel discussion that I was on. Um, but we, we are a part of this situation because, you know, the wealth of this country was built on the labor and the work of black Americans. And so all of the opportunities that we have are because of that. So we need to acknowledge that and we need to try to make things more equitable here. And one of the things that I often mention as well is that, you know, the immigration system in this country was specifically set up not to allow Asians to immigrate to this country and not to allow Asians to become citizens of this country. And it was not until the civil rights movement where those uh, immigration quotas were abolished because they were considered to be racist and where South, where South Asians and Asian Americans were allowed to become citizens. So even those most basic rights that we have and the fact that for most of us, the fact that we're in this country is because of the civil rights movement. So we need to acknowledge that those people uh, in those communities in the black community specifically fought for us. And so we need to be able to give that back and make sure that we're all working for equality um, and resource allocation and support for, for everyone. 
You know, as these conversations continue, Mayor, and as we see more of the federal and state governments get involved even more in the legislature, what do you hope happens with this entire situation? What are some of the possible resolutions, I believe, uh, that we could look forward to? Sure. Well, we need um, more equal uh, resources, especially in, for school districts, for minority-serving school districts. One of the things that a lot of people might not realize is that New Jersey is the fourth most segregated state in terms of its school districts in the country, which means that there are white students who would go to school their entire career and never see a black student in their classroom and vice versa. And that has to do with the history of redlining and the exclusion of black communities from the more wealthier, prosperous areas and the fact that they were not allowed to build wealth through property ownership, which is how a lot of Americans do and American families do build their wealth. Um, you know, I would want to see more equality in terms of the distribution of wealth in the country. Um, recent research has shown that the average white American family has $170,000 of net worth and the average black family has $17,000 of net worth. So, you know, one race has 10 times the wealth of the other. That's not showing that it's a level playing field. It's not showing that everyone can accomplish whatever they want. Um, so we need to provide more opportunities to equalize that. And, um, you know, that's what I would want to see. And then certainly in terms of uh, racism in the schools, that needs to be stamped out. No student should ever be called the N-word. I find it absolutely appalling. And the sad part is, Sometimes it is South Asian American students and young people who are engaging in this sort of racist language, and that is absolutely unacceptable. So I would want to see, you know, no, no, no incidents of racism happening in the schools. I would want to see black children encouraged to, you know, go to college if that's what they want and not told that they should go to community college. Like, these are all the sorts of small one, I mean, it's not small, but so many things that add up over time that really uh, traumatize the black community. And so I would want to see that go away um, and for there to be more opportunity for, for the black community and for all of us to be able to accomplish what we, what we, what we want in this country. Um, but I think the first step is acknowledging the disparities. And a lot of people are doing that now who maybe were just not aware before. Yes, definitely. And I truly appreciate you for bringing that perspective in. I think it's so important for South Asian Americans or just the immigrant population to just see what is happening in the nation and understand that this is a story of you and I as much as a story of, you know, the black community. You know, um, we are coming towards the end of this interview, but I just have a few questions left for you. Number one, how important is voting this year? for the entire nation. And according to you, if you could give one advice on terms of voting, what would you say? Well, voting is extremely important. It's your, your vote is your voice. And um, there are many people who don't have the right to vote. For, so for many of us who do, it's really incumbent on us to use that right. And today is primary day. If you haven't voted yet, you still can, if you are, are registered debt or Republican, you can still submit your ballot, uh, either postmark it or drop it in one of the uh, drop boxes, or you can vote in person at a few locations within each municipality. So definitely vote. Uh, the November election is probably going to be one of the most important elections that, you know, has happened in, in our lifetimes. And it's really, I, uh, I think it's a time to think about what direction we want our country to go in and, um, and what what elected officials represent our values, my advice would be to not be cynical. As, as hard as it is, and we might want to believe, well, politics is just a mess. It's all terrible people. It's not all terrible people. It's a, there's a lot of good people who want to do good things. And you have a right to tell those people if you don't agree with what they're doing. As their constituent, you can contact them. You can meet with them. You can demand that they change their votes or change their policies, but don't cynical can get better and it's really our responsibility through voting to make sure that the best people are in elected office yes definitely you know i truly appreciate you here for your time mira jaffer just one last message to our audience and i would love for you to give a message to all the young south asian americans watching you especially i would say i really feel for you this is a very hard time to be a young person i think it's probably the hardest for high school and college students 
than it is for anyone else because this is you know traditionally a time for you to be independent for you to be exploring different things um, and unfortunately we're all kind of locked up at home for the most part but i would say that you know life is long there are a lot of opportunities right now we really need to focus on our health so please mask up wash your hands keep physical distance um, and get involved in the political process make demands for what you want for your future because you know the decisions that are made now will impact your lives more than anyone else so definitely get involved and we we need you and we want to hear your voices yes definitely well thank you so much for your time here on ITV Gold. I wish you and the township the best. Thank you so much.